Nice to see you here this morning. As Mike mentioned, we're, we're living in uncertain times. They've always been uncertain in some respects, and yet we have a Savior that is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And so, how can we fear? Uh, we're in the hands of the Holy One who can't love us any more than He already has. How wonderful is that? <clears throat> Let me invite you to take your Bible this morning. You can open it to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 18, as we continue our chronological study of the life of Christ. And we're going to learn more about what God considers to be greatness. <clears throat> now, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, you remember that we were looking at the first four verses of Matthew chapter 18. And... Uh, Verse 1 says, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And the reason they said that is because they got busted. They were having a discussion that they weren't aware that their Savior was privy to about amongst themselves who would be the greatest in the kingdom. And uh, uh, that's a really sad discussion if you think about it. Um, because this occurred again on the heels <clears throat> shortly before this discussion happened, Jesus declared that he has to go to Jerusalem and to suffer and to die and to rise again. And so when he's talking about the great work he's doing, they're wondering who's going to be the greatest. And it's, it's really kind of embarrassing. But that's typical of who we are by nature, because by nature, all of us in whatever little world we're functioning in would like to be on top. We just want to be the big fish in our dinky pond or whatever it might be. But the question should have never been asked, and it revealed a flaw in their thinking, and by virtue of the fact that we're sinners, uh, that flaw exists in our thinking as well, and it needs to be addressed. You know, like everything else, almost everything else in true Christianity, what people normally think about how to get to heaven, <clears throat> and how to avoid hell, and what the Bible actually teaches are poles apart. Uh, grace of God is foreign to our natural thinking. Most people think that uh, they, and if they're loved ones, they go, to, I mean, why wouldn't they go to heaven, right? Why wouldn't they go? The whole concept of hell is abhorrent to a natural man. In the minds of most, it's reserved for the worst of the worst of humanity. That's just how we like to think. It's just too awful to be true. In fact, its line of thinking is reinforced through the media that you watch. You, you know, you never watch a you know, if you watch any kind of a movie or whatever, the, the good guy always wins and the bad guy gets what he deserves. And people think in those terms that if I'm good, I go to heaven, I'm bad, I go to hell. And I'm not that bad. I mean, the average religious person thinks that he's doing okay. He's, you know, hasn't done the unthinkable in his estimation, and, and so he should be all right. You know, and that's why this phrase, this proverb, uh, catches people off guard. It says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the reality is its end is the way to death. And that's scary. And what the Bible says without sugarcoating is that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all deserve to go to hell. But the good news is we don't have to go there. You know, you might compare yourself to your neighbor and think you're doing okay, but that's the wrong comparison. And that's what Jesus is trying in an indirect way to bring to the forefront of the thinking of his disciples here and those that are perhaps listening. I'm sure he shocked the group when he gave his instruction on greatness. Uh, he's gonna have, he says here in verse 2, Then Jesus called a little child to him and sent him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means, no way, shape, or form enter the kingdom of heaven. And that was undoubtedly a shocking statement. And so greatness in the kingdom requires, first of all, that you be converted in your thinking to that of a little child. You need to be converted in your thinking to that of a little child. You need, how to, change, you need to change how you perceive yourself. That is the issue here. The word converted there means to turn, turn from your self-seeking ambition and embrace, as it were, the innocence and the unpretentiousness of a child. Allow yourself to be turn to childlike thinking. And it's important to recognize the child is held up as an ideal, not of innocence, because 
Everyone's born a rotten sinner that's selfish to the core. That's not what he's after here at all, or purity, or faith, but of humility, unconcerned of social status. That's what he's after here. It's part of recognizing that you as an individual have no means to save yourself, just like a child has no means to take care of himself. He needs someone else to do it for him. I mean, if I think I'm something when I'm nothing, why would I see a need for a savior? If I think I'm great or good enough, I don't see it. And if a child thought like that, and again, he's, he's selfish by nature, but he's not, you know, like I mentioned last time, a two-year-old doesn't even know what he's wearing. Someone else has to dress him. That's the idea there. He's not thinking, man, am I some handsome dude strutting my stuff at two years old? He doesn't even know what shoes are. So again, he needs someone else to take care of him, and he's essentially helpless in that regard, and that's how we all have to recognize ourselves to be when it comes to the spiritual realm. We're helpless to save ourselves. In fact, I thought this was cute. The Miller daughter in question, what do you deserve? I like the guy's look on his face. Do I deserve heaven, more money, fame, or hell? How would you answer that? Well, the Bible's answered it for us. Since we've all fallen short of the glory of God, I can say the answer to that question, final answer is I deserve hell. That's how you should look at that question because that is the correct answer. When you deserve hell but get heaven instead, that's what you call amazing grace. The Bible says you're saved by grace. Grace means you get something good that you absolutely don't deserve. And we're all guilty under the law. You know, when, when the judge pronounces someone guilty, he doesn't say guilty and leave it at that. He also pronounces a sentence that goes with the guilt and the wages of sin is death. And so if justice was served, we would all have to spend eternity in hell, but justice was served, but not by one who was guilty, by one who was innocent. God can't change who he is, just like a just judge. He has to punish sin. And we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all deserve this punishment. But in love, he punished his own son, Jesus, in our place. The innocent died in the place of the guilty. And to understand the gospel means you understand that at the cross of Calvary, your sins and my sins were placed upon Christ. He was bearing the wrath of God in our stead. He was dying for you. He was dying for me because someone had to pay. And if you wanted to pay for your own sin, you, you're welcome to do that. That's a dumb decision, though, because you have to spend eternity in hell to pay them off. And that's not what God wants. And so in love, he sent a Savior. And he cried under that cross, it is finished. And that means your debt and my debt was paid in full. And so the issue in salvation is not getting rid of your sins from the standpoint of you doing something. It's accepting the fact that someone else took care of your bill for you and paid your sins for you. So the question then becomes, what must I do to be saved? And every individual needs to decide for themselves. And the decision they need to decide is, what do I think of Christ? Am I going to trust him and him alone? He needs to be received according to John 1.12. You need to receive him. You need to make a decision regarding him. And the only way to heaven is by receiving Christ as your personal savior. There are no back doors. There are no pluses or minuses. It's Christ and Christ alone. And your willingness to trust him as the savior. We receive Christ through faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for by grace. Again, you're getting something you don't deserve. You're saved how? Through faith. Faith is you're taking your trust and reliance and placing it on Christ alone. That's why it's guaranteed. Notice, that's why the verse goes on to say, it's not of you. It's a gift from God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Very important here. It's a gift. It's not of you. It's not of works. But it's the most important decision everyone has to make. And we live in a day and age where everyone's afraid of getting something or something happening, and yet do they ponder that the reality is that everyone at some point in time is going to die? It might not be next week. It might be 50 years from now. But you're going to die, and eternity is a long time to be wrong. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Trust Christ today. See, again, grace is... You get good things you don't deserve. Mercy is when you are spared some the bad things you do deserve. And God is generous with both. And the cross of Christ proves that. And so God in his mercy, grace, and love says, I will save you if you would simply accept it. But you need to humble yourself and, and be like a two-year-old child that says, wow, I need somebody to take care of me. And that's the issue. And that's really the mindset that he's after here. And so that's the first thing he said in verse 3. 
But then he continues in verse 4. He says, therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so greatness in the kingdom, first of all, you need to enter by becoming like a child and trusting Christ alone as your Savior. And then secondly, I got trouble here. You need to remain humble in your thinking like that of a little child. So you humble yourself to get saved and you live the Christian life the same way you get saved. You have that same mindset that without Christ I can do nothing and that he is worthy of my service. He's worthy of me yielding myself to him as a living sacrifice. And this is why Jesus Christ has the highest position in the universe because no one humbled himself like Jesus did. God became a man and then as a man he became a slave and as a slave he died the death of a slave. The worst death you could die, the death on the cross, and therefore he's highly exalted. That's the correct mindset of greatness in God's eyes. It's not about me, it's about Christ. I like what Rolverb said here. He said, Jesus, in effect, was saying that they were asking the wrong question, the disciples. They should have never answer, asked the question at all. They should have been asking, and this is the question you and I need to ask, how can I best serve the king? Not how am I going to be great? Rather than how can I best serve myself, because that was the bottom line behind their argument. The child in the arms of Jesus was a graphic illustration of loving trust, immediate obedience, and coming to the arms of Christ, and in seeking only the position of being loved. Boy, would you have a good day if you thought like that every day? You would have a good day. True greatness involved taking an attitude of unpretentious humility instead of seeking a position of power. These were great lessons for the disciples to learn and for us as well. And so Jesus says, those, that's the mindset of greatness right there. I'm nothing, Christ is everything. But that goes against our pride. We want to be respected, we want to be well thought of, we want to be served. We don't want to humble ourselves and do the serving, especially to someone in our own mind we deem to be not worthy of anything from us. That's the challenge, that's what Christ did. To, you think you were worthy of Christ's love? Dude, look in the mirror. And think again. But now he's going to delineate some things and give us more things and more mindset and more way of thinking and actions that equal greatness in the kingdom. See, so greatness in the kingdom includes receiving another believer like you would receive Christ. Receiving another believer like you would receive Christ. Notice verse 5. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Receiving another believer, like you would see, receive Christ, is a mindset of greatness. Now receiving means welcoming. It's me welcoming someone. And it's important to recognize through this, the next, this whole illustration, he's, he's using, uh, he used the child as an illustration. He's not talking about a child literally here. He's not meaning little child literally, but one who has humbled himself or herself to receive Christ by faith. That's why in the Greek there's, there's this pronoun that indicates such, such as we could read in verse 5. Whoever sees one little child, one such as this little child. In other words, someone who thinks and humble themselves like a child. It's a description we'll see in verse 6 of a believer, someone who's trusted Christ. And so what is meant by welcoming someone in Christ's name is deliberately and readily welcoming a person in the manner that Jesus, like you would Jesus himself, is the idea here. Like Jesus himself. You welcome them, you include them, you kindly treat them, and you're doing that in his name, as his representative, as he himself would do. And this is typically, especially in this culture, how you would not welcome a child. A child in this culture in particular was basically a non-factor. You know, you wouldn't consider that in anything. You know, I was raised in an era where children were to be seen and not heard. I was raised in, a, in an era where children were to respect their elders, which is a biblical principle, and I had to learn that the hard way. Um, but I learned it, and even, even the first year I moved up here, I called Earl Mr. Swarthout. The guy was, I mean, that's, it was hard for me to call him Earl. Because that's how I was raised. You know, the principle hasn't changed, but society sure thinks it has. As I'm sure that you've experienced. But again, the thinking here is that you would treat others 
with the same hospitality that you would treat the Lord himself. That's the sense in which you welcome or receive him. And so you welcome fellow believers of whom Jesus loves with the same love he loves you in the same way that you'd receive Jesus in the same way that he would as well. And again, in this culture, children, imagine an adult setting where you're having an adult gathering of some kind. Children would be a non-factor. That's the idea here. And so he's using the child to illustrate a point. He's turning the normal social order on its head because back in this culture, just like it is in our culture, when you'd welcome someone, you'd welcome someone of equal social status or above. You wouldn't bother with someone below you. And so the message he's sending here is don't, flail, don't fall prey to the Christianized version of social climbing. You know, a lot of times people in the world receive other people with an eye of advancing themselves, improving their own situation and reputation. It's about using people to get ahead. And he's saying as a believer, that should be the farthest thing from your brain. You know, if you're thinking that way, you're thinking, I'm going to buddy up to this guy because I can do so selfishly. That is coming from the sin nature. And if I'm only in something for what I can gain from it on a selfish level in the church, that's not coming from the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit wants to, to minister the Holy Spirit wants to minister to you to transform your thinking so that you minister to others in the same way that God ministered to you. It's all about service. Everyone wants God to serve them. It might be very selfish, give me the Powerball numbers, or it might be very selfish, Lord, get me out of this jam, or keep me from getting COVID. But I don't care if that guy gets it. Let him get it on. I mean, like you're the center of the universe. And by nature, we all think we're the center of our universe, and we're the center of our own universe, and if someone's causing turmoil in my universe, I hope they get their just desserts. That's how the sin nature thinks. You're to welcome every believer, not because you think they're worthy or it might advance your position. And this has always been a problem in the church. What did James have to say? He says, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the partiality. He's the Lord of glory. It's his glory, not yours. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there also should come a poor man with filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, well, here, you sit here in my seat I reserve for you, and you say to the poor man, you stand there, or you can sit here by my smelly footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And the answer is, yes, you have. Yes, you have. That's not welcoming Christ. That's, you know what, you're showing how ungreat you really are in doing that. And it doesn't matter what the type of prejudice is, whether it's economic status or race or anything else that forms a basis for a distinction in your mind. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're cut from the same bolt of cloth. We have the same position in Christ. We're equal members in the body of Christ. Your thumb is no important than your pinky as far as your body is concerned. And so to favor some people and disregard others based on outward fleshly factors is a terrible sin. It existed then and it exists now and it's good until Christ comes back. But if you see again yourself properly in Christ, what do you have that you did not receive? Nothing. If you are what you are by the grace of God, can't you show the same grace to someone else that God showed you? You know, if God gave you a, the brains and you've got a good job and things are well for you, don't think you're something when you're nothing. Recognize that God could pull a, he could flip the switch in a heartbeat. You could be out on the street next week. You could be healthy as a horse one day and on your deathbed the next. And you have to recognize that we are what we are by the grace of God. You know, James said this right before this. He says, pure and undefiled religion, and this is true worship of God in this context. That's what the word religion means. Before God and the Father is this. Visit orphans and widows in their trouble. People that are in difficult circumstances that demands a lot from you. 
and then you keep yourself unspotted from the world. See, greatness is associated with this mindset, that Jesus will say later in Luke 11. Whoever exalts himself, and you're exalting yourself based on what God has given you, so that makes it embarrassing right there, but you're going to be humble. He who humbles himself will be exalted. That's God's formula for greatness right there. He also said to him who invited him, as he was invited to this nice dinner, when you give a dinner or a supper, don't ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or your rich neighbors, lest they invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, and God says you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you. You shall be repaid when? When it matters. At the resurrection of the just. That's greatness. Greatness is, you know what? Apart from the grace of God, I'm just a scumbag loser. And I recognize that. And I just want to use what God has given me for his glory. I don't care who you are. That's the right line of thinking. See, that's what unconditional love is. The very love that Christ showed you, the very love that Christ showed me. And dying for you, like you are more worthy than someone else to be, have Christ died for you. And the amazing thing is the Holy Spirit took that same love, put it in your heart, and filled your heart with it so you can be a vessel of that love to someone else. Amazing, isn't it? See, the test of unconditional love is doing something you might not naturally like to do that costs you something for someone that you might not like or even hate by nature. Now we're getting to unconditional love. That's why he says widows and orphans. They have serious need, they're vulnerable, and they cannot repay you. And so greatness means receiving those who by nature have nothing to offer. Now this pricked the thinking of the disciples because it's not recorded here, but it's recorded in Mark and Luke. John asks a question. In Luke 9, 49, it says, Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. See, Jesus is just giving a lesson on grace. He's thinking, you know, maybe I'm not thinking straight here. We saw someone casting out devils in your name. And this becomes even more interesting when you realize that just a short time ago that the disciples couldn't cast one out and Jesus had to bail them out after he came down from the Mount of Transfiguration. And so here's some guy that's not connected with their group casting out demons in the name of Christ. He was doing something they failed to do recently. And they thought it was improper for him to be doing it because they probably thought it was reserved for the elite 12 here. This guy's not part of our group. Their greatness was being stolen by some unknown. He was stealing their thunder, as it were. And it says, we tried to prevent him. We forbade him. We said, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. Why? Because he doesn't follow with us. He doesn't say he doesn't follow Christ. He's not one of us. He's not one of the elite. One of the upper crust, upper crusty. Wrong conclusion. So Jesus clarifies the issue. He says, don't forbid him. For no one who works a miracle in my name, I'm going from Mark now, can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. For whoever gives a cup of water to drink in my name, I don't care who you are, Jesus is saying. You're willing to serve and give someone a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ. You're going to have a reward. What an encouragement to be great by serving even a cup of water. Did you ever think about that? This is why, as believers, we need to be thinking all the time because eternity is in every minute. How I handled that situation, what I chose to do in this moment for so-and-so, or what I didn't choose to do. Eternity is in it. We're all going to be turned inside out at the judgment seat of Christ. A cup of water. Something that the world says is completely insignificant. God says, I saw that, and you're going to get rewarded for it. And the world says, huh, why'd you bother with that person? You know, another thing we need to recognize here is that it's easy to fall into the same trap of Job's friends. 
Job says to his friends, no doubt you are with the people and wisdom shall die with you. His three friends thought, we're God's gift to you, Job. We're here to encourage you. Boy, friends like that, who needs enemies, right? And sometimes you think, you know what, we got the corner on the market here. You know, people do not have to agree with us in every point of doctrine. And we can rejoice that God is using other people. And we should rejoice. Now, obviously, we don't compromise what we know to be true, nor do we work with ones that don't preach the gospel clearly, because that would be dishonorable to God. But we're not the only game in town, as the phrase goes. There's other people God is using, and we need to be thankful for that and recognize that. Some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. So important to remember. And so Jesus is actually saying this. He says, stop forbidding. It's the negative with the present tense. He's saying, you're thinking wrong. See, Jesus had no sympathy for this exclusive spirit that they were displaying. I mean, here, their little house they built is now being torn down because someone else outside their house is doing the work of the Lord. No! We will not have that, thank you. He says, anyone who does a miracle in my name is with me. He's with me. They've got a positive attitude toward me. He says, they can't, speak, they can't be against me. Otherwise, it wouldn't be happening. And so he says, he who is not against us is on our side. He's on our side. He's with us. He's not hostile toward us. You need to welcome him. He's our brother. Now, we need to be discerning, discerning because Jesus said it appears the opposite. In Matthew 12, he was not with me, it's against me. What does that mean? Different context. This is the context in which the nation rejected Jesus. And so what they were saying is that Jesus does his miracles by the power of Beelzebub. In that case, they're not with me, they are against me. That's an act of opposition because they're claiming that Jesus is doing something by the power of the devil. So in that context, this is what he meant. In this context, he's saying this guy's positive. The Lord's using him. He's our brother. Give God thanks. Hopefully that makes sense. Welcome him. I mean, obviously, if someone's down with Jesus, and we know that he's not a brother in that sense. And so that's one aspect of being great, welcoming everyone like you would Christ. That brings us to verse 6. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me, and there's the clarification. He's talking about all believers. And sin, excuse me, believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. So now we have another aspect of greatness in the kingdom. It's not causing another believer to sin. Now, in the Greek, it starts in verse 5 and it's mentioned in verse 6. Whoever welcomes one, and notice the use of the pronoun here, such, it means such as a little child. In other words, one just like, this is a pronoun, one just like a little child, it's a description of a believer. That's why you could actually read verse 6 like this. But whoever causes one of these little ones, dash, who believe in me, dash, to sin. So it's... It's an apposition, it's describing, he's describing a believer here in the context or in, by using a child as an illustration. That's how he's using it throughout this, this context here. Now that's not to exclude actual little children from the blessings of Jesus. It's not questioning their ability to believe in him. But he's just affirming these are believers of any age, whatever age they are, they're little ones to him. They're precious to him is the idea here. And he's saying, don't you entrap one of my children. See, that verb to sin means to cause to fall into a trap. And the Lord is therefore speaking of enticing, trapping, or influencing a believer in any way that leads him to sin in the sense of destroying one spiritually. I got a typo there. Spiritually. So 
So it's like getting caught in a trap. This is the same word that Jesus used against Peter. When Peter said, Lord, you're not going to go to Jerusalem and die. What did Jesus turn and said, you get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. You're trapping me into sin by not doing the will of the Father. You're minding the things of God, not minding the things of God, but you're minding the things of men. So it's the idea of causing someone to not do the will of God and to sin. The word itself talks about an animal that's caught by touching the bait affixed in a trap. And so Jesus is saying here, a person who's responsible for causing a Christian to commit sin is an offense against Christ himself. It's an offense against this child. And it's something he takes very serious. So serious, he says, it's better to die a terrible death than to cause a believer to sin. Pretty strong statement, isn't it? In fact, he says there in verse 6, it would be better. You know what's better than causing your brother or sister to sin? Die a terrible death. Whew. You know, it says there that that millstone was an upper millstone. It was stone they used in the grinding of a grain on a mill. It was so large and heavy that it had to be harnessed by a donkey to a donkey by a large beam. It was massive. And so if that was tied around his neck and thrown into the sea, I mean, he says, to the depth of the sea. I mean, you could use a smaller stone and put it in shallow, but he's speaking here of, of the severity of what's going on here. That would be better. He'd be better off with a terrible death than to cause and lead someone into sin. Now this is mentioned more than one place in the New Testament. You know, Christ said this, or excuse me, Paul said this to the carnal Corinthians, who were characterized by strife and division and envy. He says, do you not know that you, this is plural, are a temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you, plural? He's talking about the church here, not individuals. If any man destroys the temple of God, i.e. the church, God will destroy him. For this, the church is holy, and that's what you are. Hmm. So he's talking about the church corporately. He mentioned this in Ephesians 2. In whom all the building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. He's talking about the church here. Jews and Gentiles combined in the church. In whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God the Spirit. That's what the church is, corporately. The dwelling place of God the Spirit. Peter says it this way, And you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So it's, it's a motif that's used throughout the New Testament. So again, plural. Think about this as plural. And what Jesus is ta or what Paul is talking about here is the divisive spirit that was destroying the church. Right in his introduction of the epistle, he says, Now exhort your brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree there be no divisions among you, plural, that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Remember, there was envy, strife, and division. And what's the promise here? If you destroy God's church, God's going to destroy you. Because God says, this is holy. My church is holy, man. That's how I want you to look at it and see it. So this is a pretty severe warning. And you destroy the church through false teaching or a factitious spirit. Now this is not talking about losing your salvation. That's not what he's talking about. But it might result in maximum divine discipline because later in this epistle, what does Paul say? They were mistreating us 
mistreating each other so poorly. Paul says, let a man himself and so let him eat bread and drink of the cup. In other words, humble yourself before the Lord, admit your sin. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, that's the Lord's Supper, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. That's called divine discipline. The term sleep is used for a believer that was divinely disciplined and taken home early because they were destroying, as it were, the church. If we would simply judge ourselves, we wouldn't be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened. This is disciplined by the Lord because we're not condemned with the world. No believer can be condemned with the world. So when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Let's show a little love. If anyone's hungry, let them eat at home. This church was destroying itself. Jesus says, I take this seriously. It'd be better if you had a millstone strung around your neck and you're thrown in the deepest part of the sea. God defends his own work. And you know, in some cases, it might be referring to the teachers and the, the authority and, and, and you know, church leaders oftentimes misuse their authority in a, in a church to their own advantage and destroy the flock. I mean, that was Peter's second epistle says he warns people about false teachers. But you know, you could be other believers that seek to derail other believers on a personal level. You could tempt them to sin. Isn't that what Eve did to Adam? Destroying another person? Come on, Adam, take a bite. Come on. Or you invite some other believer to partake in your skullduggery of some kind. I mean, Aaron the high priest led the whole nation into worshiping a golden calf. Jeroboam of Israel not only led a rebellion that split the nation, enticed the northern tribes to worship his false system. Jesus had to address this. The scribes of Jesus' day had a, the wrong teaching on divorce, leading people astray. You know, you're not using your liberty and love can destroy another believer. What Paul said here in Romans 14, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Making an issue out of food, God help us. All things indeed are pure. All things, even that garbage you ate for dinner last night is pure before God. And it's evil for the man who eats with offense. It's good neither to eat meat or drink wine or do anything but which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Paul said this to the Corinthians, but when you thus sin against the brethren and you wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I'll never eat food again. I'd be willing to give up food if it makes my brother stumble. That's what he's saying here. You see that God takes this seriously? I'm not to cause my fellow brother and sister to fall into sin. I'm not to hinder non-believers coming to Christ. We can by way of application through my sin. You know how you prevent this? Whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there's nothing in him to make the other brother stumble. If I'm walking in the light, and I'm having a love affair with Christ and the love of God is shed abroad in my heart and I'm loving you, I'm not gonna give you a cause to stumble. Very easy to prevent. Without Christ, I can't do anything. I probably will stumble you. With Christ, I can love you and by God's grace, I won't stumble you. But he doesn't stop there, verse 7. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offensive must come, but woe to the man by whom those offenses come. Ooh, he's raising the bar here. Jesus expands his warning to the world in general and to the individual unbelievers in particular. He says the world here in verse 7, and he pronounces a woe here. He says offensive or traps must come. Traps must come. All the unbelievers here are sentenced to a woe because the world entraps other believers to sin. And so the unbelievers of the world are given a woe. Woe. And Jesus, if you read Matthew 23, gives eight woes to the scribes and Pharisees 
And it says they're going to have a greater damnation in hell because they, of what they did to the nation and leading them astray. Now, what is woe? Now, you might be thinking, oh, I watched a Western last week, and the guy kept saying, whoa, Nelly. That's <laughs> not what it is. It's not woe. It's woe. <laughs> it's woe. <laughs> woe. Woe doesn't mean stop, all right? Woe is the exact opposite of a blessing. It's the equivalent of saying, cursed is the man, for his punishment will be great. And so this is a pretty stern warning that Jesus is giving to the world here. And he says, he says again in verse 7, they're going to come. Why? Because guess what? The world hates you because they hate Christ. In John 15, it says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Guess what? You're not. Yet because you're not of the world, I chose you out of the world, the world hates you. And so they're going to set a trap for you. They want to bring you down. They want to watch you fail. They want to point the finger. They want to condemn you. They want to come up and want to use you as an excuse as to why they reject Christianity. And so there's death traps everywhere. And the methods are going to range from physical persecution to false doctrine to enticement to your own personal desires. So Jesus takes it a step further by saying, oops, that each man, notice he says, but woe to the man of whom the offense has come. So the world in general is under a woe, but then the individual that partakes in this and does it has got his own special woe. Everyone's going to receive judgment according to the spiritual damage they do. This is why the religious Pharisees and scribes got a greater damnation, because of the spiritual damage they did through their false teaching. And as a believer and as a pastor, I read James 3.1, it says, Be not many teachers, you're going to receive the stricter judgment, because you're in a position of influence. And you could lead people astray. But now Jesus here interjects a warning should be to the world, this is typo day, to the world to get saved. He says in verse 8, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off, cast it from you, for it's better for you to enter into life, lame or maimed, rather than having two hands and two feet and be cast into everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, it's better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes and be cast into hell fire. This is not the first time Jesus has said something along these lines. He actually said something similar to this in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. Here he just says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you. It's more profitable than one of your members perish than the whole body. That speaks of the whole person be cast into hell. And if your right hand, here he used the issue right and right, causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It's more profitable. It's better for you the one of your members perish, and for the whole body be cast into hell. Sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? Now, are we to take Jesus' words literally here? Is he advocating self-mutilation? Uh, no. The words are literal to this extent. If it were necessary to lose a bodily member rather than one soul, then we should gladly part with a member, but it's not necessary. Never is necessary. Christ is making the issue here entering the kingdom versus thrown into the lake of fire. It's a salvation warning. And no one receives salvation by stop sinning. That would be impossible. Remember, Jesus is using the natural traits of a child to illustrate how he wants you to think. And a child is capable of natural trust to someone like their parents who would care for them. That's the idea. The issue in getting saved and not going to hell is not to stop sinning. Then you wouldn't need a savior. You could get there on your own. And there are those who actually think they've stopped sinning. Mercy. And I try to remember when I think about that, if I'm having a conversation, so you're proud about that? Pride's a sin. It's the number one sin. Hey, I'm proud of the fact I haven't sinned in 10 years. Whack. So Jesus is not commending self-mutilation here. 
Because it's still possible to pluck your eyeball out or cut off a limb and still sin. Why? Sin begins in the mind. You possess a sin nature. That gives you a desire and propensity to sin. Jesus here, even during on the Sermon on the Mount, made the heart the issue, not removing body parts. Because you can remove all your body parts, that doesn't fix your heart. Remember, Jesus said if you hate someone in your heart, you're a murderer, even though you cut off your hand so you couldn't pull the trigger. Jesus said if you lust after a woman, you're guilty of adultery. Even if you plucked your eyes out, you still can do it in your mind. Right? I mean, think of David. Was there anything wrong with David seeing a woman bathing herself? No. It's what he did with it in his mind. That's when it became a problem. And it led to adultery. And so, you're not to take this literally. That's not his point. Asceticism doesn't beat sin. And it doesn't get you into heaven. And we talked about this Wednesday. As a believer, you died with Christ from the principles of the world. And so, as though living in your world, why do you subject yourself to regulations, rules and regulations, to beat sin? You could be an outstanding rule keeper and be the most proud, arrogant sinner in the room. Don't touch, don't taste, don't handle. I didn't have my Big Mac this week, I'm special. I had mine, and I'm special, so there. All concerned things which perish, these things are temporary, they have no lasting value. And notice, they're according to the commandments and doctrines of men. Their rules come up with men. God didn't say these things. I follow my own rules. I'm pretty special. We don't have a TV in our house. Notice, they have an appearance of wisdom, but it's a self-imposed or self-made, it means self-made religion. I got my self-made religion, and I follow it pretty good, thank you. And then it's false humility. And I, you're proud because you're neglecting the body. I'm fasting this week. Thank you very much. Please note that I am fasting. Notice, they're of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. None. Who cares that you didn't eat anything? Or, you know, you didn't do the nasty nine, the filthy five, or the sinful six? Doesn't mean a thing. It's not how God works. You know, you could gouge your, gouge your eyeball out and cut off all your hands and still be bitter to the core to the guy next to you. Didn't really take care of that sin, did it? Now, on practical terms, if you're having trouble with something, you should obviously avoid it. In fact, Paul says this. Let us walk properly as the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. I got a problem with envy? I got to deal with that internally. But if I got a problem with drunkenness, I can, there's other ways. But the key, though, is to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, because without Christ you can't do anything. But then make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. But you got to put on Christ. You got to put on Christ. You got to walk by faith. You need to abide in Christ. That's the key. Jesus is trying to say listen, as a matter of principle, remove whatever offense. But you don't go to heaven or into the kingdom because you haven't offended someone. That would, again, be a works of salvation. A little more time. Let's go fast here. Greatness in the kingdom includes not despising other believers. Verse 10. Take heed that you not despise one of these little ones. Again, it's the same idea there. One such as these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. So Jesus warns that we must not despise those who belong to him. I think I forgot to put that on your hand up. What does despise mean? Literally means to think down on. Carrie's idea to look down on someone else as inferior and not worth considering or care. Remember, this is again, believers of any age. Jesus called that child to himself in verse two to demonstrate the principles of true greatness and you have to think like a child.
But greatness in the kingdom is not found by pursuing the things the world finds important. Now, the result of despising someone is treating them with contempt to disdain them is unimportant or not worth your time. When you're thinking like that, you're not thinking like Christ, and you're not thinking, you're thinking the opposite of what he deems to be great. Now, if you think about it, remember the context of all this was the disciples bickering with one another about who's the greatest, which means in the one mind of one, he thought he was superior and the other was inferior and vice versa. They were despising one another. That's what they're talking about here. I mean, if you're arguing about who is the best, it means you must be arguing about who's inferior, right? The proud and self-seeking push themselves up by pushing others down around them. And they have jealousy and envy and resentment instead of humility and encouragement. Humility says, you know what? I got the mind of Christ here. I'm here to not think every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of other. I'm here to, in what way can I build you up? Mm. That's how you think. I mean, if anyone had the right to despise someone, wouldn't it be Jesus? Isn't he superior to everybody? No one compared to him, yet he demonstrated the, the, the reason he's the greatest in the kingdom is because he humbled himself the most. That's the mindset of greatness. There's no room for Christians to despise each other. You know, if someone has a different conviction of you in an area of liberty, don't look down upon them. So it's different. I remember years ago, it took 10 guys, I, 10 years for this one guy to see a principal. And he finally got it. And then he went around to try to straighten everyone else out. And I said, listen, it took you 10 years to see it. Will you give these people some room? I go, just because you see it doesn't mean everyone else has to see it. It's true when you're despising, you're going to be showing partiality, which we already talked about. You know, you despise someone, and this happens in a church. Somebody falls into sin, and other believers treat them worse than someone who had the plague. Where Galatians 6.1 says, come along and says, you are spiritual and restore such one in meekness and humility. Instead of throwing them under the bus and condemning them and all the rest of it, you come along and say, how can I help you here? That's the spirit of Christ. Now, it's actually, you'd be treated better if you got the plague because the plague would somebody say, hey, how can I help you here? But no, you're an awful sinner. I will disdain you. And Jesus gives an interesting reason here. Why aren't you to despise other believers? For I say to you, that's a point of emphasis, that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now this is where people get the idea that everyone's got a garden angel. You remember where that came from? Right here. Especially children, right? This is what it says. Now I don't know if everyone's got a garden angel or not. But I know it's, they have angels. God has assigned angels to each believer. But it says here they're up in heaven. And we know from uh, Hebrews chapter I think 13, that angels are ministering spirits that do the will of the Father. And so spirits are, these angels are ministering spirits being sent out by the Father to minister to his children, including you and me. That's, there's probably several angels in this room checking us all up. That's kind of creepy. Angels. Now, I don't know what these angels are up to, other than ministering spirits. But what that indicates in the message he's sending is that they're very precious to God, which means you're very precious to God. And if you're very precious to God, that other believer who you might not like is precious to God too. And he's got angels working on both of us or working for him toward us, or whatever it is exactly. Isn't that something? That's how concerned God is for you. That's how concerned God is for me. That's how God is concerned for us as a body of Christ. This is serious. We're to love one another with a pure heart fervently. We're to in humility 
try to build one another up for the glory of Jesus Christ. Nothing tears apart a church like the self-righteous one looking down his long nose at the one there. I mean, if that's how you think, either get right with or go somewhere else. We're here to help each other, not condemn each other. And it starts by saying, you know what, Lord? I am what I am by the grace of God. Why do you bother with me? If you recognize that God shouldn't be bothering you, you can have the right attitude toward everyone else. Right? So do you want to be great today? Become like a child. And I'm not talking about throwing a temper tantrum and demanding your way. That's not what I'm talking about, so let's be clear. Right? It's just turn and think like a child from the standpoint you recognize that you're helpless. And then remain like a child. And then welcome other believers without partiality. And then don't cause your dear brother and sister in Christ to sin. And don't despise other believers. Isn't that interesting? Jesus said, you know, if you want to be great, I want you to go witness to 50 people. And I want you to, you know, do this, that, and give me a list of things where everyone will stand up and watch me and say, hey, did you see what I did here? No, he says the exact opposite. Welcome the people that everyone else throws away. Be so mindful of your ability to cause someone to do something wrong, do the opposite, and encourage them to do what's right. And instead of despising someone, come alongside and say, how can I build you up in Christ? That's greatness. And you know, we're all going to stand before Christ and give an account. And I know that's scary sometimes. It's just things are not always what they appear, are they? Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So may, by God's grace, our hearts be humble and right before God. Maybe we exalt him in our thinking and let's prefer one another in love for the glory of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we're just humbled once again as we look at the word of God and see it's alive and powerful and exposes us for who we are outside of you and then who we are inside of you. Thank you that in Christ we have all things that pertain to life and godliness. May we have humble hearts that want to see you exalted. Help us to understand greatness as you understand greatness so that we'd see that we're nothing outside of Christ. And yet, we're so important to you, you have angels in heaven that belong to us somehow. So help us to just maintain a humble heart where we seek those things which are above, where you are, and set our affections there so that you can work in us and through us for your glory. So thank you for these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.